primarily because of my uh, serving on the uh, House uh, Committee on Education and Workforce. Unfortunately, schedules got a little uh, mixed up and he was unable to, uh, to make it and Fernando reached out and asked if I would still uh, uh, come and speak with the group. Of course, I said I would. And so uh, I, most of my comments are, are focused on the original education topic uh, that uh, we were supposed to speak about with, uh, with the president of uh, CSN. Uh, so again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's been a very uh, interesting time to serve on the uh, Committee of Education and Workforce in the House of Representatives as we've had uh, a lot of uh, education bills that we've actually been able to put out uh, over the last year, uh, most of which in a, in a bipartisan manner. Uh, understanding that uh, education is critically important uh, to the future of this nation. I feel like if we don't invest in uh, educating our youth today, our country is going to be without uh, leaders tomorrow. Uh, in fact, the ranking member uh, of the Education Committee, uh, Bobby Scott out of Virginia, uh, when we just passed out a couple of bills this past uh, week, uh, had a great uh, quote and entry uh, in his uh, opening statement uh, that I asked him if I would be able to use because I thought it really summed up uh, what the importance of is of education. So, you know, a college degree remains the surest path out of poverty and into the middle class with census data showing that earnings increase as the level of education increases. In other words, the more you learn, the more you earn. In addition to increased earnings, individuals with higher levels of education are less likely to be unemployed, less likely to receive public assistance, less likely to work in unskilled jobs with little upward mobility, and like, less likely to become involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, and that's why uh, when I got to uh, the House of Representatives, I actually asked to sit on the education committee. And when I did that, folks kind of looked at me with a, I, got, I was a crazy guy, asking to actually sit on education. I was told that you know education is kind of, a, that committee is kind of the place where um, when there's folks left over and leftover slots where we put people because nobody really wants to volunteer to, to sit on the education committee. And I thought that that's unfortunate. Uh, my undergraduate degree was in education. I uh, thought that uh, I was actually going to be a teacher. Uh, and then I did, until I did my student teaching assignment. Uh, and then I realized that I just had neither the patience nor could you ever pay me enough money uh, to actually be a teacher. Uh, so I decided to go into something less stressful, and I went into emergency medicine. Uh, and to this day, though, I still believe that emergency medicine is much less stressful than, than being a teacher. Uh, but education con continued to be an important issue for me, and I was uh, blessed to serve uh, on the Education Committee when I was in the State Senate, uh, and then, of course, asked to sit on it when I was in the, uh, elected to the House. My three children are all products of the Clark County School District. Each one of them has gone to a different institution of higher education here in the state of Nevada. Uh, so I understand what the trials and tribulations are of both parents and students, as well as teachers and administrators uh, when it comes to education issues in this state. And that's why I've made it a focus of mine. And I've been successful. So over the last uh, several years, uh, we've actually had four pieces of legislation uh, that we were able to get passed, uh, three of which have been signed into law. Uh, the other one's currently pending in the Senate uh, that actually address education. And I try to address education across the entire spectrum, from K-12, to college, to postgraduate, and even after a, a college degree, when you look at the idea of being a lifelong learner, I mean, folks needing to continue to stay up to date or when they want to change jobs, how do they get that, that job training assistance? Uh, so the first piece of legislation that we all worked on in a cooperative way was the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act, which was the re rewrite of No Child Left Behind. Uh, you know, No Child Left Behind was uh, uh, passed during the Bush administration. I think it was something that had uh, a good idea, but was flawed in execution, uh, where there was a very heavy hand out of the federal government uh, coming up with different accountability measures. Uh, those that uh, were in schools or had children in schools that heard about making adequate yearly progress, and if you didn't make AYP so many years in a row, the government would come in and take over the school, fire everybody. And what we found is that, unfortunately, to, to meet AYP, everybody started teaching to the test. Uh, and we saw so much use of standardized testing uh, where teachers would take time to then train for the week before the test uh, and then take the test and then you lost two weeks of instructional time. Uh, and so every student succeeds to access, look, we need accountability. First, remember that there's unfortunately very little money comes from the federal government to state and local governments when it comes to education. In fact, in the Clark County School District, only about 10% of their budget comes from the federal government. But it comes with an awful lot of strings attached, meaning they've got to spend the money where they're told to spend it by Washington. Not where they need it, but where they're told to spend it. Uh, so we said, look, we've got to figure out a better way to have accountability measures. Even though there's a small amount of money coming, it is federal dollars, we want to make sure that those federal dollars are being used in a way that best achieves student success. And we did that by returning accountability measures to the state, realizing that, look, each state knows best how to measure the academics of their student. 
Now, even if you look at a state like Nevada that is so diverse, the Clark County School District, the fifth largest school district in the country with 350,000 students to some place like Esmeralda County, uh, where there's only about 700 people that live in the entire county. So even with our state, we have very different systems uh, that need to be able to account for the educational uh, product uh, that they're putting forward. Uh, so we returned that to the state. We got rid of 60 different duplicative programs uh, that were underperforming uh, or had never really actually been authorized. And instead of taking the money from those programs and saying we're going to take it back, we put it into a flexible state funding account that said, look, instead of giving you this money attached to any one of these 60 programs and telling you where to spend it, whether you need it there or not, we're just going to provide a grant for that amount of money to each state and say, you use it, it's flexible, use it where you need it. We also looked at the Common Core, which has been a, a big area of controversy. Uh, a lot of folks think that Common Core came out of Washington, D.C., but it did not. Washington, uh, Common Core actually came from the National Governors Association. It was a state uh, grassroots effort amongst governors to try to get to the point where a high school diploma means the same no matter where it comes from. Uh, but the goal behind Common Core was that it was always supposed to be voluntary, that a state could adopt it, or if they didn't want to adopt it, they didn't have to. Uh, what happened several years after uh, was that the Department of Education started a new program called Race to the Top, which was supposed to be another bucket of money uh, to go out to schools uh, in, the, in the states. But in order to qualify for Race to the Top funds, one of the requirements was that you had to adopt Common Core. Uh, so it was kind of a coercive measure on the part of the administration to get states to adopt Common Core, whether they wanted to or not. Uh, and initially, uh, Nevada adopted Common Core, applied for Race to the Top. We did not get the grant, but we got Common Core. Uh, so we said, look, it's okay if a state wants to adopt Common Core. We, that's what we're trying to say, is return those decisions to the state. But the federal government shouldn't be trying to coerce states to do it uh, through grant dollars. So we put that into the bill as well, saying that, look, there can be no coercion uh, on the part of the federal government to try to force any state to adopt any type of curriculum, whether it's Common Core or whatever else may come down the pipeline. So what we think, you know, based on the uh, Every Students at Seats Act and returning responsibility for accountability measures, giving more flexibility to the states, allowing the funds to flow where they're most needed, while still making sure that states meet the intent of the law, the education law, um, that we are gonna actually give more opportunities uh, for states to do better in educating their youth. So that was kind of the big issue on K-12. The second issue is career and technical education, which I personally happen to be a big supporter of. You know, there's a big push that every child needs to go to college, and that's great, but the fact is not every child is meant to go to college. And that doesn't mean that they shouldn't graduate high school career ready. And that's where career and technical education, I believe, fills a very important role. In fact, we always hear in the newspaper about all the things wrong with the Clark County School District. We never hear what's right with the Clark County School District. And I'll tell you, one of the things that's right with the Clark County School District, among others, is their career and technical education program. We have some of the best career and technical academies uh, anywhere in the country. And the magnet school programs that try to expand those opportunities into traditional high schools uh, do a great service for our students in increasing access to this type of education. Uh, and you know, if you go to any one of these CTAs, I, I've been to all of them. Uh, for instance, the uh, Southwest CTA has the automotive uh, program, and if you were to walk in there into their shop, it's better than any shop at any car dealership anywhere in the valley. Uh, Veterans Tribute High School is the public safety uh, career and technical education program where they teach uh, crime scene analysis, emergency medical dispatch, uh, EMTs, forensics. I was over there. They actually have a dispatch center, a real dispatch center, set up in their school that is so good and so high tech. Uh, that it actually now is the backup dispatch center for Las Vegas Fire and Rescue. That if their center ever goes down, they plan to go over to that high school and use the high school center uh, for their dispatch. Right? So these are incredible programs. Now here's the issue with career technical education. About uh, three years ago, the administration wanted to take $100 out of the CTE uh, federal funding and start a new grant program. So that actually meant that there would be $100, $100 million less in the CTE funding pot. So that triggers what was then called the whole harmless provision. Because there's a provision in the uh, Perkins Law that says no state would ever receive less money than it ever received in 1998 when the Perkins Law was last reauthorized. 
Well, that's great if you're from a state that has a stagnant population. Not so much if you're from a state like Nevada, uh, where we've seen explosive growth uh, over the last decade and a half. So quite honestly, if, if that $100 million was moved to a grant program, the Clark County School District in and of itself would have lost $4 million in CTE funding. So we were able to block that, and then we said, but we've got to fix this so it doesn't happen again. So, and as I normally do when I try to find, when I find an issue that's particular to my district, I try to work in a bipartisan way. Uh, and I look for another member from the Democrat side who has the same issue. And in this case, it was Representative Raul Grijalva from Phoenix, another rapidly growing area that would have the same problem as we did if that $100 million were shifted. So I went to Raul, who also sits on the education committee, <coughs> and I said, you know, maybe we should look at a way to try to fix this, and we came up with a fix that changes the whole harmless formula, uh, so that in the event there's ever a cut, no school would ever lose, or no district or state would ever lose more than 90, would not go below 90% of what they had the previous year, but in fact redoes the whole funding formula so that the state of Nevada would actually wind up seeing an 11% increase in career technical education funding because it's based on population. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get that bill uh, passed out of the uh, House Education Committee just last week uh, as part of the bigger CTE bill, uh, and that'll be going out to the House floor soon. And we, again, a bipartisan vote, the CTE bill passed out of the Education Committee, uh, unanimous voice vote, and we expect to get that out of the House as well. So CTE education is another very critical, important piece uh, of the education system here in Southern Nevada. And I think that the reason for that is you have really engaged students, and you have very passionate teachers. As I've gone around to a lot of these CTAs and the magnet schools, the kids have told me that if it wasn't for this program, I'd be a dropout. But I'm here because I'm actually learning something that I feel, one, I have an interest in, two, it keeps me engaged, and three, I know that when I graduate, I'm gonna get a good paying job. And a lot of the teachers in the CTA programs are actually on their second career. They're folks that actually had worked in these fields as a professional, and now they're coming into the school district to teach with that wealth of experience that they gained uh, from actually working uh, out in the private sector. The third area that we've been working on is uh, the cost of a college education. You know that uh, student loan debt is uh, now the second highest uh, debt per capita uh, after mortgage debt in the country. Right? The issue for us and for me is really why is the cost of a college education far outstripping the rate of inflation? Right? So we've got to look at ways to control the cost of a post-secondary education for those that are going on to college. So there's a couple things that we were just able to do, two bills that we just had passed out of the House, uh, again, with unanimous voice vote. One is simplifying the financial aid program. Who in here has filled out a FAFSA? 108 questions. 108 questions, uh, many of which you don't have the answers to at the time that you're filling out the application. Why? Because most people want to start applying for college in the fall of their senior year. But you have to use your income tax data from the following April, which you don't have. I mean, your parents, you, know, you don't have that data available. Uh, and so that either delays applications, which makes students less competitive, uh, or they fill out an application with flawed data and make a decision about where they want to go, only to find out that they're not going to qualify for as much financial aid as they thought they would. And then they're scrambling to find another school, or are scrambling to figure out how they're going to pay for that education. So we said, look, there's a couple things we can do to make this simple. First, we want the, the, the student and the family to have all the data that they need to make an informed choice as early as possible about where they're going to go for their post-secondary education and whether or not they can afford it. So a separate bill looked at putting up kind of a, a college-based uh, dashboard that will put important pieces of information up there so that you can compare what the cost of an education is, what the average graduation rate is. What is the average income for the degree that you're thinking about pursuing for graduates from that school? Right? A lot of students think, well, I'm going to go and study whatever, and that they're going to graduate and get a job you know, making $40,000 a year, only to find out that well, the median salary in the country is maybe $25,000 a year. And so they're already behind in, what, in their financial plan. Right? The bill that we introduced was streamlining the federal financial aid process, which said, number one, Let's allow parents and students to use their income tax data from the prior year. People's income tax and their income don't change that much uh, over the course of a year. But if you can use what we call prior prior year data, then you'll have a better understanding of what you would qualify for. And 
we're going to set it up so that most of the data will populate automatically from the Internal Revenue Service, so you don't even have to enter it. Once you put in the Social Security number uh, or the uh, ITIN number, uh, it'll take the data from the IRS and automatically sweep it into the form, thereby decreasing the opportunity for mistakes, which also will have an impact, and allowing you to kind of skip over many of the 108 questions. Uh, so we believe that that's critically important. Again, that was a great bill that we were able to introduce uh, with uh, Jared Paulus out of Colorado, another individual who's very uh, focused uh, on uh, uh, college education, streamlining college education. Last year, we changed the way uh, federal student loans uh, interest rates were calculated. Here's the problem. Uh, before, student loan rates were set by Congress. Now, anybody in here in the banking industry or financial services industry? Okay. The last thing you want is 535 members between the House and the Senate trying to figure out what an interest rate should be. <laughs> There's better ways, people that actually do this as a living, to figure out what interest rate should be. So we set the interest rate at the 10-year T-bill rate. This way it fluctuates with markets, with a, with a cap saying that at no point can it ever go higher than 8.25%. Uh, so there's that fail safe. But allowing interest rates to fluctuate with the economy. Uh, and we've seen over the last three years, since that was put into effect, student loan interest rates have decreased every year. Uh, and they're keeping pace with what's going on in the community. So that's a way to also to try to help make college more affordable. The other piece we're looking at is trying to redesign how you earn a college credit. You all know that right now, if you're going to take a free college credit course, uh, you've got it, usually it's one hour uh, in the classroom three times a week. You know, there's so many hours of uh, out-of-class work that they expect you to be able to accomplish. But what if you could get that done faster than a semester? Why should you have to pay to sit in that seat for 10 weeks? So we're trying to move to what we're calling a competency-based uh, system, where you can demonstrate a mastery of the material, and if you do it shorter than a semester, you're allowed to move on to the next class. Right? No need to be paying for a course for 10 weeks if you've already got the experience and the knowledge and can show a mastery of the material in four or five weeks. Let's allow you to move on. The goal is to get students back to the traditional four years through college, realizing that there will still always be the not traditional student, especially here in Southern Nevada, where a lot of students have to work in order to afford their college education, which means they have to go part-time, which means they're on the six or seven year plan. But we want to try to make it easier for them to get done in that four years. The other piece is uh, summertime use of Pell Grants. Right? Previously, you're not allowed to use Pell Grants for summer semester. They're only dispersed in the fall and the spring. So again, that puts those students that need to go over summer because they can't carry a full load because they're working in the fall and semester, uh, fall and spring semester, the opportunity to to use that Pell Grant that they are eligible for, to use it when they can actually go to school. And so that's what we're looking at to try to, again, keep down the costs or make it easier for students to be able to afford a college education. After college, for those that want to go on to a postgraduate degree, uh, you know, as a physician, uh, I've noticed you know, certainly since my time here in Nevada, uh, we have a critical shortage of physicians. We have a critical shortage of just about every healthcare provider in Nevada. Uh, but we certainly have a shortage of physicians. And even more so, say that we have a, a shortage of what we would term culturally competent physicians. Physicians that know how to take care of minority populations. Uh, I know, I, I grew up in New York. I come from an immigrant Italian family. My grandparents were from Italy. And we grew up in a family where, first of all, you never went to the doctor unless you were truly on your deathbed. And then you only went to the doctor who was the Italian doctor down the block. Because it's the only person you would trust because he was, you know, had your background, he had your heritage. Well, as the Latino community grows in Nevada, we need to make up the shortfall in Hispanic physicians and, and in other healthcare uh, professions as well. So uh, as, as you all probably know, there's a, an entity called Hispanic Serving Institutions, uh, which is a federal designation for colleges and universities that have at least a 25% enrollment of Hispanic students. CSN is an HSI designated uh, college in Nevada. Uh, UNLV, I think, is just, I don't think they've made it just yet, but they're just on the cusp of being uh, recognized as an HSI. Um, and why is this important at this time here in Nevada? Because we've got two new medical schools that are opening up. Right? We have Toro and Henderson, we've got the uh, School of Medicine up in Reno, but now we'll have the UNLV School of Medicine opening up, and Roseman University of Health Sciences is going to be opening up a medical school. So we're going to have more opportunities 
for students in Nevada who graduate college to go to medical school in Nevada, and that's great. Mm -hmm. But research shows that after medical school, only about 30% will return to where they went to medical school to practice. About 70% will stay where they did their residency to practice. So we've got to grow residency program. so we're looking at, at that as well. But the HSI bill basically says of the monies that are appropriated to states for use at their HSI institutions, that they can now use those monies to help mentor, prepare, tutor Latino students to move on to any postgraduate degree in the healthcare professions. So that's going to give folks a leg up in being better prepared, uh, one, even to introduce them to the idea of going into healthcare, but have them better prepared for when they hopefully will go on to medical school, uh, audiology school, nurse practitioner school, anything that requires a professional license and a postdoctoral degree would be covered. So that's a way that in which we can try to increase culturally competent physicians through medical school. The last piece is then how do we get them their residency training? And so uh, joining with uh, uh, Kathy C uh, Caster out of Florida, another state that has uh, a, a dearth of physicians or a shortage of physicians, we introduced a bill uh, that would actually start to grow new residency programs. Uh, residency programs are funded largely through two streams of money, Medicare uh, and the VA. Well, we've all heard about the issues in the VA. Not sure if we're gonna be able to grow more residency slots there right now. And you've all heard about how Medicare in 2024 is probably not even going to be able to pay full Medicare benefits. So there's not a whole lot of money in Medicare to start growing new residency programs either. So, so we've got to look at a way that's innovative outside of the box to get folks to invest in growing residency programs. And so what we did was we introduced the CARE Act, the uh, Creating Access to Residency Education, that sets up a grant program that any entity, whether it be a state, a local hospital, a local school, uh, who wants to start a new residency program or grow an existing residency program if you're in a state that has a critical shortage of doctors, which is the uh, residency slots, which is defined as less than 25 slots per 100,000 residents. Uh, and if, if it's in primary care, uh, we will the, the grant will give you two thirds of the money if you come up with one third. Uh, if you do any other specialty, it would be a 50-50 match. So we're trying to continue that, not just get through co uh, college, not just medical school, but then be ready to go out into a residency program because the goal then is to get them to stay in Nevada and practice their new profession. The last piece is the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act, uh, which we also passed last year, which I had a, a piece that I wrote, a freestanding bill that then got incorporated into that. And what that does is talk about how does federal workforce training dollars get used in the states and what are the accountability measures. And this was critically important after the 2008 recession, when a lot of folks lost their jobs. A lot of jobs were lost in Nevada that probably won't come back. I and mean, we're seeing different jobs come back but folks lost jobs that they had for 10, 15, 20 years that may not be coming back. They need the opportunity to be able to retrain into a new career. And that's what the Workforce Investment Opportunity Act does. It provides the training to get people not into the jobs that were, but into the jobs that will be. Not the jobs of the 20th century, but the jobs of the 21st century. You know, and I, I talked to several folks who, you know, 38 to 42 years old, who had worked in the same place 10 or 15 years, who had lost their job, and so you know, I went to try to find a job. I'm being told that I'm too qualified uh, to go to work you know, at a fast food joint, but that I don't have the skills necessary to get the job at some of the new industries here in town. What am I supposed to do? And that was the, uh, the genesis behind my uh, writing the piece of the Workforce uh, Investment Opportunity Act, is to provide the opportunities for that lifelong learner who needs to get retrained into a future job to have the opportunity to do so. Uh, so that, those are the issues that we have faced, uh, I believe, on the Education Committee. I, I really wish that the, the uh, President uh, Richardson was here because you know, CSN has done an incredible job uh, at meeting the needs of the non-traditional student. Uh, whether it's the part-time student, whether it's the lifelong learner returning to school to, to learn a new trade or a new skill, uh, very engaged in the community, and as the only designated uh, HSI within the state of Nevada, is filling a very critical role. Uh, but that's uh, what I want to talk about today, primarily on education. Uh, obviously, there are still several issues uh, that we're facing in Washington, D.C. National security continues to be uh, a big issue, uh, especially when we see what's going on, not just around the world, uh, but here in our own country, whether it's Orlando, whether it's San Bernardino, whether it's the attacks on our uh, men and women in, in behind the badge. Uh, this cannot become the new normal uh, in our country. 
Uh, and so uh, as a member of the Armed Services Committee, as a member of the House uh, Committee on Intelligence, I've been engaged in looking at those issues uh, and how do we make sure that not only do we help maintain uh, U.S. leadership around the globe, but how do we make sure that we keep our own country safe? You know, it used to be uh, we want to keep the fight over there so that the fight doesn't come here. You know, the fight's here. The fight's here now. Uh, and we've got to figure out a way to address the issues that we're seeing here uh, at home, whether it's through the inspired uh, extremist, uh, who, if a U.S. citizen gets radicalized here and decides to go out and, and commit an act because he's been uh, radicalized or inspired by ISIS or Al-Qaeda, uh, whether it's an individual who just you know, feels um, that they have been disenfranchised by society uh, and feels that the only way they're going to make a statement is by going out and taking an innocent life. Uh, those are the issues that, that we have to address in this country. And, and we're looking at addressing those, especially from the mental health perspective, which I think is one of the, the biggest uh, issues that we are facing when it comes to controlling gun violence. Uh, and we just uh, actually, uh, two weeks ago out of the House, uh, passed a piece of legislation, a very comprehensive mental health bill uh, that provides increased resources for mental health services all across the country. You know, for the longest time, Nevada had the fewest number of publicly funded mental health beds of any state in the country for the population. Uh, and, you know, working in a hospital emergency department for 25 years, uh, there would be times when over half of my emergency department beds were occupied by patients with mental illness who were on a legal hold waiting to be moved to a mental health facility. Right? So we have to figure out a better way, not just in places that are underserved like Nevada, but across the country, uh, to address mental illness. Uh, and the mental health bill, I believe, that we passed, uh, which interestingly was written by a psychologist who happens to be a member of Congress uh, from Pittsburgh, will go a long way in helping us uh, address uh, that issue. Um, Jobs in the economy continues uh, to remain at the forefront. Uh, again, here in Nevada, uh, we're still, you know, we're bouncing, we're coming back. Our unemployment rate's down, and that's a good thing. Uh, but you know what? Even though it's down, we're still, I believe, the last I checked, the third highest unemployment rate in the country. Uh, and when you look at what's called the U6 number, which is the number of people marginally attached to the workforce, people working a part-time job who really are looking for a full-time job, or that person who's in the employable age group who just stopped looking because they're so frustrated, uh, that number uh, is still up at around 10% uh, in Nevada. Uh, and so we have to do more to create those good paying jobs so that the individuals working two or three part time jobs can get one single good paying full time job uh, to be able to take care of their families. Uh, and we believe that you know, the way to do that is making sure that we have reasonable regulations that protect consumers, employees, and the environment, but not overburdening regulations that strangle whole small businesses. Uh, that we have a pro-growth tax code uh, that allows small businesses to grow. You know, 54% of the workforce in Nevada is the small business. They're in small businesses. You know, everybody thinks everybody works in the hotel and casinos up and down the strip, right? But 54% of the workforce is in a small business. Uh, those are the economic engines uh, that drive this economy. Uh, and so we've got to make it easier for them to get access to capital uh, in order to be able to hire and employ and to create good paying jobs uh, for their current and future employees. Uh, so I think, you know, those are the three areas that I tend to concentrate in the most. It's education, healthcare, jobs and the economy, uh, and education, the four areas. Um, so uh, it's an honor to serve the uh, Congressional uh, Third District uh, and represent the Third District in the, in the House of Representatives uh, on those committees that I serve and able to talk about those issues. And again, identifying a problem that we see in Nevada. I mean, most of the bills I've introduced have come from folks that live in CD3. So it's always that, that joke when somebody comes up to you and says, you know, there ought to be a law. Well, you know, folks have come up to you and say, you know, Joe, there ought to be a law. And this is what it should do. Whether it's, you know, career technical education, whether it was the Stolen Valor Act that we uh, passed earlier uh, to protect the, uh, the sanctity of uh, the most valorous military awards, uh, whether it was simplifying the financial aid form, all those things generated from individuals in the district that we meet with. Uh, so we appreciate the opportunity uh, to meet with our constituents and to hear what's on their minds because that's what makes uh, me a better informed representative of them uh, in Washington, D.C. So, again, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here. We've got time for uh, maybe a few questions. I've got about uh, 10 minutes before I have to get to my, uh, my next appointment. Yes, ma'am. Now, this is a big sandbox. We're all playing very nicely in the sandbox, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Likely to go to the game. Now we know people in the 
game, you're likely to be preyed upon by parents. So the problem with the education of not graduating from high school now is creating a bigger problem in our world and not just in Nevada. But what can you do, what can we do with respect to that 60% rate of being on males not graduating from high school who then end up in a criminal system that we as citizens pay $145 for a night to be in jail, which is a $500 million budget for Metro and that's a great question. That's why you know, I mentioned it in my, in my uh, opening comments. We know that you know the pathway to success in a, in a uh, successful life is a quality education. You know, we, we know those that are educated, you know, less likely to use social services, less likely to wind up in the uh, criminal justice system, uh, you know, less likely uh, to wind up in jail. Uh, and so that's why I spend a great deal of my time working the education issues on the education committee trying to make sure that every child, regardless of the community that they come from, has an opportunity to be able to get that quality education. Now, a lot of that can do with school choice, right? Which, you know, this state was on the cutting edge when it introduced uh, the, uh, the education savings accounts, right? Ultimately, it's a, it's a parent's decision, it's a parent's responsibility to make sure that their child gets the education that they need. And in order to make sure your child is getting the education that he or she needs, you've gotta have choices. Right? Like I said, it doesn't mean that the Clark County School District isn't doing a good job. I, I hold out the, the career and technical education programs as a place where they excel. But that might not be the environment for your child, uh, where your child is going to have the opportunity to really succeed. So why should you have a choice to be able to put your child in, a, in an institution of higher learning or elementary education that's going to better serve them? Uh, so it's all about, I believe it all starts at education. Uh, again, which is why my undergraduate degree was in education and why I'm such a proponent. Um, we have to make inroads now. You can't wait, right? As I said in the beginning, education of our youth today is what's gonna create the leaders of tomorrow. And this country needs leaders. We've gotta make sure that we have the individuals that are gonna be able to take the mantle of leadership no matter what they decide to do. Whether it's corporate America, whether it's wearing a uniform, whether it's in public service, political life, we need to educate those individuals so that they're ready to assume the mantle of leadership uh, when they graduate high school, when they graduate college, or when they come out with their postgraduate degree. Yeah. Yes. Hi, uh, good morning, Congressman. My name is AJ Bubai, and I'm an Air Force veteran, so I'm really happy that you're here. Um, I served in the military for six years, and I'm very proud of my military service. Um, I was deployed several times to Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but um, one more thing that I'm very proud of is the fact that I'm an immigrant. Um, because of the military, I was able to get my citizenship. Because of the military, I was able to get my mother's um, green card and eventually her citizenship. So my question to you is, who should I believe? The Joe Heck that once said that he supports a pathway to citizenship, or the Joe Heck whose actions and rhetoric are very harmful to the immigrant community? You've supported, you've blocked DACA, you've uh, wanted to defund um, services for immigrant, the immigrant community, so who should I believe right now when you also are part of a, uh, of a party whose head right now is extremely dangerous to the area. Hey, you've asked your question, let, yeah. let the congressman yeah. answer, please. No, I appreciate it. First, thank you for your service. Uh, and you know, there is a program that remains in place called the MADNI program, Mil Military Accessions Vital to the National Interest, that allows for immigrants to join the military, <laughs> that aren't citizens, uh, to join the military and gain a pathway to citizenship. That program continues uh, to this day. Uh, so, and that's the pathway by which non-citizens are able to join the U.S. military and, and gain an expedited citizenship. Now, you know, when we have talked about, uh, you know, whether it, the, the whole DACA uh, issue, I have always said, always said, that I believe that any child who was brought here through no fault of their own, and whose only country that they know is the United States, and has graduated from a high school here in the United States, should have a path to citizenship. What I said was, it should not be done by presidential edicts. It should be done by Congress. It should be done through law. So, this is not a debate. No, no. Uh, please, okay? So, let so, the so, 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 and here, and to show my commitment to that very issue, here's the bill that I drafted in 2013 that I drafted with members of the activist community here in Las Vegas who met with me for over 10 months as we hammered out the language of how to make sure there was a DREAM Act that allowed a pathway but also held uh, individuals accountable right here, 2013. And we worked on it and worked on it. We even had the active immigration attorneys involved. And we got it down to the language that everybody agreed to. 
Everybody agreed to this language who had helped write it. And so we then held a uh, round table with over 50 individuals where we were going to roll out this piece of legislation. And it included uh, representatives of education because one of the ways to be able to get uh, the pathway was to get a college degree, whether it was a two-year degree, a four-year degree, uh, or a certificate of training. We had the unions there because one of the ways to get a pathway was completing an apprenticeship. Uh, we had military members there because one of the pathways was completing uh, a, an enlistment. All of that was there. We had all of these folks sitting around the table. And as we started the meeting, the very people that helped me write this bill stood up and said, we can't support this bill. Because they were more concerned about keeping this a political issue than they were about getting something done. They, the people that helped me write it said, we cannot support it. So I said, well, I'm not going to introduce a bill that, that has no support in the community. But you voted right? differently. And then, oh, hey. uh, then six months later, six months later, members of the community who were associated with Mia Familia Voda came to visit me in my district office and said, Joe, how, how can we get you to introduce the bill that you wrote? We really need you to introduce it. I said, it's simple. You get me 10 Democrat co-sponsors. I'll bring 10 Republicans, and we will introduce it as a bipartisan bill. I said, but you've got to do it soon. This was in, I believe, May of 2014. I said, so you've got 30 days. Your record does not show that, sir. You're voting for okay. 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 the next question, please. No, actually, my record does show that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks so much, Congressman, for coming and speaking to us uh, today. You mentioned that uh, gun violence has been happening across our country. Um, and I recently received a letter from you saying that you supported background checks. Um, and I'm curious if that includes expanded for you background checks. Um, and if it does, why have you not stood with the House Democrats um, to ensure that we have those expanded background checks, especially after the massacre that happened in Orlando? So it's a great question. So here's the issue that you have on background checks. Back, expanded background checks at this point in time will provide a false sense of security to individuals. Look at all of the mass shootings that have the tragic tragedy uh, that have taken place uh, over the last two decades. All of them have been committed with weapons that were obtained legally. An expanded background check would have not would not have stopped that individual from getting access to that weapon. What are the issues? The issues right now are that all the records that need to be in the instant background check system aren't there, especially mental health records. States aren't submitting them. There is a, a concern over whether or not it violates uh, patient privacy to send those records in. So we have worked on legislation, and I have supported and voted for legislation that provides more money to states to send their records in and to take care of that patient privacy issue uh, that some states have so that they can actually submit the records necessary to the background check system so that those who do get a background check will be caught. I think it was the uh, Virginia Tech shooter uh, was the one uh, who was kind of caught in a gray zone from the time that he had received mental health care till the time that he went and purchased the gun legally, filling out the form, and was cleared by the background check system because his mental illness record had not been submitted to the background check. So that's number one. Number two is we actually have to prosecute. Criminals by nature, I don't think, are a very smart group of people. But you know, some of them are not are even less smart than others. And they will actually try to go to a gun store and buy a gun legally. And they'll fill out that form and sign it, and thinking that they're going to get a gun. And then when they get caught, and the gun owner, the store owner says, sorry, you're not eligible to uh, purchase a firearm, we don't prosecute them. We don't prosecute them. So you've got to prosecute those that are attempting to buy guns illegally. Lastly, we need to strengthen the laws against straw man purchasers. That third party. So I know that, Fernando, and I'm just using this as an example, I don't know for sure. But I know that Fernando isn't eligible to own a gun. But I'll buy it. <laughs> you know, then just give it to them. I'm a straw man purchaser. We need to go after those individuals. And we need to address the number one cause of gun violence, which is mental health. Those are the things that we need to do first if you really, really want to have an impact on gun violence in this country. And those are the things that I have supported and the things that I will continue to vote for. Now, i got time for one more question. Sir? Oh. Go ahead. Hello. Good morning. Congressman Donut, my name is Rosemary Flores. I'm a pro-immigrant activist in the state of Nevada. Uh, do you support massive deportation and families uh, being sent to family detention centers? No, I've always said that I do not believe 
that you can find, round up 12 million individuals and deport them. Because first, you know, finding them and rounding them up is number one. Number two is we can't afford it. We're already $19 trillion in debt. Uh, that is not the answer. Mass deportation is not the answer to the immigration problem that we face in this country. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Again, I want to thank you all very much for the opportunity to be here with you today.